Okay, welcome to another pro, uh, presentation in North Carolina Masonic Research Society. Tonight we have Brother Ben Sorensen uh, uh, from right here in North Carolina. Glad to have him. Uh, just an incredible historian. Um, he's kind of my go-to guy. I think he makes half the stuff up, but no, he really doesn't. He's a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant historian. Uh, so Ben is... Uh, he's a member of St. John's Lodge Number no. 1 in Wilmington, North Carolina, and he is a history professor with the North Carolina Community College uh, system. He's currently pursuing his Ph.D. Ben lived in Slovakia, speaks fluent Slovakian, uh, and even taught English to Slovakian students and business owners uh, across that country. So very, very accomplished uh, gentleman, and we are thrilled to have him tonight. So, Ben, I'm going to hand it over to you, and uh, can't wait to hear it. Wonderful, wonderful. I really look forward to hearing it myself. Um, so, <laughs> hello, everybody. I'm Ben Sorensen. It's a real pleasure to meet you guys. Um, and if you notice, I have my youngest son bouncing around behind me. I've never figured out how to actually make the background work. But I'm about to share the screen and start this uh, PowerPoint. Now, today's topic is Cornelius Harnett, who was a founding father of the United States and uh, also the, the greatest son, I would say, of North Carolina. And not only that, he was a North Carolina Mason. So uh, we're going to delve in. And here, I'm going to start sharing it now. Let me know if you guys can see it. And starting my slideshow. Can you guys see it yet? Sweet. All right. So we've got it live. All right. So this is Cornelius Harnett, North Carolina's son and America's founder. Now, there are many reasons I say that. One moment. Adam, turn that down. Sorry. Sorry. Ten-year-olds. Okay. Uh, there are many reasons I'll say that. And you'll discover it as we go along. So, uh, just some background. Cornelius Harnett Sr., this is his father. His father, I found, was born in Dublin, Ireland. Um, actually, it's uh, George Burrington, the governor, who made a reference to it. Now, he moves to Edenton um, about 1730, about 1720s. Um, it's really hard to say exactly, whoops, exactly when he got there. Uh, he was actually became a successful merchant, and he had some very powerful friends, including the governor, George Burrington. Now, George Burrington tried to appoint him to his council. Uh, he said he wanted to get a set of persons that will go into any measure he shall propose. Um, and in fact, that was something that some of the people that were against George Burrington also said. Now, a couple little things about George Burrington. George Burrington was, um, a, he was boisterous. Um, he was more... Mm, outspoken than he was intelligent sometimes and he loved to get into fights in fact the end of his life they find him murdered so it gives you an idea of exactly what what type of person we're talking about here now when george burrington had put harnett in here harnett of course uh cornelius harnett senior was of an independent mind i like to say he really did think for himself now burrington uh he actually had some choice words here uh burrington actually i'm sorry this thing keeps moving on me um he would call him a blockhead uh, a tool a fool he he was not kind at all to Harnett whenever he realized that Harnett wasn't going to just roll over for all of, um, for all of his wishes. Now, um, when he joined the board of, whenever he joined the board of trade, uh, Burrington also tried to get him off. And in fact, he said that Harnett sitting on the board is a disgrace to it. Now, it's interesting that Burrington also said that Harnett, Cornelius Harnett, he thought was worth 7,000 pounds and worth even more once he had come to North Carolina. But regrettably, he said that Cornelius Harnett lived in public housing and was basically penniless. Now, actually, this doesn't seem to be true at all mainly because Cornelius Harnett will leave Edenton and he moves to a new town called Brunswick in 1732. 
Now, Brunswick is on the southern banks of the Cape Fear River. Uh, it kind of stands today, but nobody lives there. It is now a state historic site. Now, there is actually a dispute at this point between Brunswick and a place called Newton. Now, I'm sure um, if everybody can see the picture, does anybody know exactly what town is in that picture? Oops. Sorry, I'll get that. That'd be back. Wilmington. That is Wilmington. Now, Newtown was originally called New Carthage. Then it turned to New Liverpool. Then it became Newtown and then Newton. This little town is situated 14 miles to the north of Old Brunswick. Now, Brunswick was actually plotted out by Richard and Maurice Moore, the two brothers. These, Rich, um, I'm sorry. Roger Moore. When Roger Moore came here, they called him King Roger. These two were members of peerage. They were nobility from England. They were truly old money. We are talking like from the 1200s type of wealth. Now, parsing out Brunswick Town so that people could inhabit it, Roger built Orton Estate, is right next door to it, and actually they built the very church, St. Philip's Church, that would host the king or the queen should they come to the new world to visit. So that church, by the way, still somewhat stands in Brunswick. It does not have a roof. It actually gets burned down. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now, these two are fighting each other for supremacy of this area of, of North Carolina. Brunswick totally opposes the incorporation of Wilmington, but when the town council starts to vote on the incorporation of Wilmington, Brunswick, of course, there's four people against it and four people for Wilmington, and the president of the board decides, oh, it's my turn to break the tie, so he votes again. Now, of course, this is comes out to a violent uproar and the two towns will never really be friends but this is just kind of the background that we have between the two cities at this time but something that is going to bring them together now born in edenton or at least uh, that that county and then moving into the cape fear is this young cornelius harnett jr now we don't have any portraits of him, unfortunately, but we know that he has a fine taste for letters and a genius for music. He was a bibliophile. Um, they said that he read with a critical eye and an inquisitive mind. Um, later, people would say that he was, um, that in administration, he would rule with an absolute adherence to liberty. So, this man is is highly intelligent. He's not the outspoken uh, wit of, say, a Patrick Henry or the, the the military prowess of somebody like George Washington by the 1770s. But what he does have is, as one person put it, he was able to read the entire volume of the human nature which is an impressive thing to say about someone. Now, Cornelius Harnett, um, we need to get into his Masonic life. And this is going to bring us to another fun question. Now, we do have in the Grand Lodge of England, there is some talk of a lodge being chartered in the Cape Fear. At the same time that that lodge is mentioned in their notes, it also mentions some in, um, in Massachusetts as well as some in South Carolina. And it seems that the Solomon was the name. <laughs> so Solomon, we know that Thomas Tim, the second Viscount of Weymouth, he actually traveled to North Carolina with the charter in tow. And that was in 1735. Now, it's going to cease work in 1754. This is where it gets kind of interesting. In 1751, something very special happened in Freemasonry. Um, I'll let anybody take a guess what that could have been. The ancients. 
Yes. Thank you. Who said that? So I can send you like a M&M or something. Stan Bevers. Right on. Thank you very much, Stan. So, yes, the ancients begin. And here's a really kind of crazy thing about any time that you have people doing any type of ritual or, well, I mean, anything at all. You get a bunch of men or women together doing something, and then some, they say, this is the way we do it. Somebody else is going to come along and tell you you're wrong, right? That's just kind of human nature. So it actually does happen that some people came along and said, no, this is the wrong one. And that new group calls themselves the ancients. And the older group, of course, calls itself the moderns, and it splits the Grand Lodge. Now here, some of those uh, ancients, they were called... York Masons. Now, uh, this lodge ceased to work in 1754. If you think about it, that would be the perfect time for a modern lodge for like Solomon to uh, abandon its work as all the members turned to becoming ancients, which is why in 1754, you might find St. John's number one being under dispensation. And um, I believe it's June 24th, 1754, payment being received at the Grand Lodge of England for St. John's Lodge number 213 to be granted a charter. Now, <clears throat> it does make a lot of sense at that timing. It just seems to fit. Now, there's also William Hooper. Now, William Hooper he had uh, signed the Declaration of Independence later, but it's hard to say, is he a member of what lodge? Um, we, ha we constantly hear, especially in the Grand Lodge proceedings of 1912, they say that he was a member of Hanover Lodge. However, as far as I can tell, there are no records of a Hanover Lodge. Possibly it was a military lodge. So, as you can see, we're about to walk into some very weird times here for Freemasonry, um, especially with Solomon Lodge possibly being there. Who knows what's happening in New Bern? It seems that there was a clandestine lodge running along because in 1755, there is a sermon delivered to the brothers of the lodge at New Bern, and it seems like that lodge was pretty well founded when that sermon was given. So... Who knows what's actually happening here? But what we do know is that somewhere along the lines, Cornelius Harnett joined St. John's number one. Now, St. John's, um, it, Cornelius, Cornelius Harnett becomes his worshipful master in 1764 as well as 1765. Um, so many patents that we have found call it a York Lodge, and it was number 213 in the English Grand Lodge until 1813. Uh, that 1813, actually, to me, is a great uh, ironic joke. Anyone want to take a guess why? Why would this lodge be kicked off the rolls in 1813? War of 1812. Yes, David, there's a war of 1812. We are going to have some fun with that. Now, what's really remarkable to me is that uh, we have two members of St. John's Lodge, the only two Americans who were told that they would never be get granted a general pardon by the British government for the rebellion. Um, the lodge basically is the, the fomenting point of Southern disagreement with the British crown. And it takes until the War of 1812 for England to say, all right, that lodge is out of here. It's almost like, okay, once we forgive you twice, that's enough done. Now, we think it looks like actually St. John's Lodge, whenever it was formed, began chartering other lodges. This is kind of a sticky point, isn't it? It's chartering other lodges, but it's not a Grand Lodge. But Cornelius Harnett at one point actually uses the title Grand Master of St. John's. That's a little weird. Now, as we move forward, um, he, we need to take a look at Harnett's public beginnings. Um, now, he was a very intelligent man. He was also a very good merchant. He had shops in Brunswick as well as in Wilmington. He was running Porch of Trade. Uh, one thing I do need to point out, I have not found any evidence that he had slaves, but I have found no evidence that he didn't. 
So it, it, it's hard to say if he's a slave owner or not. But he begins his public life in 1750. One moment. So, um, yeah, so he begins his public life in 1750 as, as the justice of the peace. Then he becomes the commissioner of Wilmington, and that's actually to the state board. Um, he serves as a representative in 1754, which is right at the start of the French and Indian War. And all through this time, he has a very close working relationship with Governor Dobbs. Uh, not the governor who had a problem with his father. No, this is the governor after one of the provincial governors, he is tight with him. So it's not that Garnett, as we'll see, seems to have a problem with authority. It almost seems like it's specific types of authority. Now, Cornelius Garnett, during the French and Indian War, we don't have a whole lot said about him, but what was happening in the French and Indian War? Well, actually, it's just the American theater of the Seven Years' War. But Oddly enough, here, it lasts for nine. So the way it started, um, the half king with George Washington, they were sent by uh, Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia to tell uh, French envoys to leave uh, Fort Duquesne, which was right outside of Pittsburgh, actually right at the point in Pittsburgh. So when told to leave uh, the French, well, Washington couldn't speak French. Uh, well, the French were ready to do this, and they were actually surrendering to Washington's forces as diplomatic envoys, and they were ready to negotiate their terms about possibly leaving Fort Duquesne. And the half-king, who was an Indian guide who also spoke French, quickly thought about what had happened to him in his, in his tribe, where... Indians that were backed up by the French had actually forced him out of being the chief. And so he decided that he'd rather have the English than the French. So he pulled out his tomahawk and threw it through the skull of Jumonville, then washes hands in the brains of the French noble and general. Uh, this actually creates the beginnings of the French and Indian War. Poor George Washington. Remember, he's only like 23 years old. He has no idea how to handle this, but he's a lieutenant at the time. But who gets blamed if troops mess up in battle? Well, the commander in charge, the chief officer, right? That's the guy who gets blamed. And that was George Washington, unfortunately. So our very first president, um, whenever he lost at Fort Necessity and actually had to sign a treaty, just to give you guys a little bit of funny insight, um, in there, written in French, remember George Washington speaks no French, uh, but written in French, it did say that he admits to the murder of Jumonville, and therefore our first president is technically, uh, technically an admitted murderer. Technically. Now, of course, you know, he didn't actually commit the murder. That was the half king. But that French and Indian War, a couple of little things about it. Um, while it's happening in America, it seems like a stalemate between the French and the English. And Indians, by the way, as they're involved in this, were actually jumping from side to side. The Iroquois tribes were making international calls um, and playing one side off the other. And they got to do this for a very short period. Um, their, their period of, of being able to hold that type of power lasts only until the end of the war. And then the English will never let them do that kind of treachery again. Um, but it, the French and the British are basically a stalemate. Now in Europe, this is where it gets really important to understand. In Europe, this is a huge world war. The war reaches from here all the way to basically India. Russia is involved. It's Prussia being backed up by the British, fighting against Austria-Hungary, who's backed up by the French. The English and the French are involved in the Americas, and we've got stalemates happening in Europe. And by the end of the war, nothing actually moves in Europe. No borders really changed. Uh, what did happen, though, is that Prussia was given recognition. Now, in the Americas, <laughs> France, realizing that they had a money pit in what they called Canada, decided that 
it would be befitting to, okay, so the spoils of war, Britain won because Prussia has basically gotten right where it is. Um, sure, you win the war, Britain, here, take Canada. Now, at first, it's kind of like winning a Maserati or a Ferrari, right? You know, especially if you have a job that pays you like 60000 a year. Yeah, you're really thrilled to have the car until you get the very first insurance payment. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, oh, it's now a money pit. Um, that's how Canada was for the British. They got it, but now it's a money pit. And also, they had been completely funding Frederick the Great in his fight against the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So they were bankrolling that fight as well. So now Britain is really feeling the pinch. Their coffers are almost empty. And they look at the Americans and they say, wait a minute, America, you're paying one shilling annually in tax. And Britons back in the mainland are paying 26 shillings annually. Now, is that really fair? I mean, could, could you imagine paying, say, income tax uh, that would change, uh, federal income tax, I mean, that would change if you live, say, from uh, the greatest place on earth, which is North Carolina, to, um, I don't know, the, um, the place that wishes it was the greatest place on earth, which is South Carolina. Okay, so if you can imagine your income tax changing from place to place, federal income taxes, you would really not appreciate the idea that other Americans are paying less just because they happen to live in a place that the federal government has said, oh yeah, we're not going to tax them. In fact, this is a weird point. We had taxes on the American colonies, but as a thank you uh, to all of the trade that we were running, England really neglected to collect those taxes. In fact, they called it salutary neglect. So there's a lot happening here, right? And after this war, you find that unfortunately, England needs to fill those coffers. Now, how do you fill those coffers? Taxes, right? Now, the Proclamation of 1763, this is also another sticking point. Um, it also said that all of the colonists had to live uh, near the coast. And then here's this line that goes right through the Appalachians. And this is all reserved for the Indians, as they had it labeled here on this map. But this proclamation of 1763 also makes the colonists very angry. They had hoped that after winning the French and Indian War, they would be able to go to places like Ohio and set up their um, plantations and make more money. And now here comes the British government saying, one, we're going to tax you. Two, you can't pass those mountains. So you can't set up a larger plantation. So many colonists began to think, hey, they're trying to keep us poor. Now, that stamp tax, this was a tax on all types of paper. Um, if it was a marriage license, if it was wallpaper, yes, there was wallpaper back then, playing cards, you name it, there was a stamp on it. Now, what you see in the red here, that is an actual stamp. Now, up north, <laughs> uh, most people were fighting against this stamp tax, and uh, they would complain, they would boycott, and on the places where you're supposed to put that stamp, they put this cute skull and crossbones you know, an emblem of the effects of the stamp, of the fatal stamp, as it says on there. That was where you were supposed to fix your stamp. Now, while many places are talking about how they hate the stamp tax, um, North Carolina is a little different. North Carolina is kind of the state that says, look, it's fun to talk about it. We're going to do it. And we still have that mentality today. And it really shows up with the Stamp, tax, stamp Act of 1765, because you end up with stamp resistance. Now, in Brunswick Town and in Wilmington, in Wilmington, the stamp collector, the tax collector, William Houston, actually gets captured by a crowd in Wilmington. They tell him they're going to tar and feather him. Now, it always sounds like, oh, what would that actually do? Keep in mind that for tar to be able to be poured, it has to be hot. 
And if you have ever burned feathers, uh, the, to give you an idea, the ancient Romans used to burn goose feathers and uh, direct the smoke into areas that they wanted to poison people because that gas becomes noxious. It was actual chemical warfare in Rome and it would kill inhabitants of buildings and, um, and other areas as they sent that smoke of burning goose feathers in. So if you have this boiling hot tar that you dump on people and you throw feathers on it, um, it's going to definitely make them sick and it's very painful. Now, once that actually cools off and hardens, imagine trying to peel that off your skin too, right? So tarring and feathering, it was certainly no, uh, no slight matter. It was sometimes a matter of life and death. People would die from it. Now, um, they told that comptroller, William Houston, that they were going to tar and feather him and he immediately resigned. But in Brunswick town, the people hit the streets, much like we see people hitting the streets today, um, and began to protest. And they actually walked around with a coffin. And as they walked with that coffin, they were all lamenting the death of liberty. Then they set it down in the middle of the town square in Brunswick, opened it up, and lifted an effigy's arm and said they could feel the pulse. Liberty still breathes. And they all began to grab their weapons pitchforks, shovels, guns, whatever they had. Now, in the meantime, <laughs> Cornelius Harnett and Colonel Ger George Moore go visit William Tryon, who is now the new governor of North Carolina. He lived in Brunswick. New Bern had him for about 18 months. Brunswick and North Wilmington had him for five years. When they visited Governor Tryon, they offered him protection. Um, and it's rather interesting, uh, depending on the accounts that you read, it almost reads as if like Masonic uh, greetings are being exchanged. So there's a possibility that, that William Tryon might have been a Mason as well. And it would make total sense that they would have all been meeting in the same lodge. But William Tryon, not being a coward, he turns away George Moore and Cornelius Harnett. He says, I don't need your your protection. Uh, he gets the tax collector, Mr. Pennington, brings him into Russellboro, which is his mansion that he lives in in Brunswick, and he then begins to grant this man protection in his home. Now, as soon as he looks out the windows, what he sees is that Russellboro has now been surrounded by 500 armed men. And in front of them is Cornelius Harnett. Now, Harnett has basically, and William Tryon says this in a letter, has basically just put the governor under house arrest. Now, Harnett says, please release Pennington, allow him to resign. And Tryon says, absolutely not. And then Cornette, Harnett says, well, we're willing to come into your house, but that's an offense that we'd rather not give you. At which point, Tryon actually replies, there's no more offense that you can grant me because it's already offensive enough that you have surrounded my house and basically imprisoned me. Now, Pennington, trying to calm everything down, he actually goes outside and he resigns his place. And Tryon sends away all the stamps that had come to North Carolina in 1766 for the stamp tax. This is where it gets really interesting. The rest of the country did pay into stamp tax even though they were protesting. North Carolina is the only colony that didn't pay a single shilling in stamp tax. All because of Cornelius Harnett. By the way, Cornelius Harnett did not get in trouble for uh, putting Governor Tryon under house arrest, which is rather interesting. And kind of, it tells you something about how powerful of a man he was. Now, in 1771, something interesting happens. And if you notice, we made a little bit of a jump. That's because things kind of quieted down. There were the other acts that came in uh, to, to tax paper, tea, molasses. Um, these were all just standard taxes. And the colonists grinned and bore it after the Stamp Act had been had been repealed. And actually, the Stamp Act had been repealed because of what happened in Brunswick Town and in Wilmington. When the king heard that, and when parliament heard that, they said, okay, we've gotten rid of those. And they immediately gave out the declaratory acts where they said, basically, we repealed the stamp tax, but remember, we're allowed to tax you because we're parliament. Now, Joseph Momfort, this is where things get kind of weird. Again, every time we go back to Freemasonry, things get a little strange. 
So he ends up getting a, a commission from the Duke of Beaufort, who happened to be the Grand Master, happened, uh, he's a Duke. He's gonna be the Grand Master of the Lodge of England, Grand Lodge of England. Now, that charter or that patent he receives, it says he is being commissioned as the Provincial Grand Master of and for America. Now, this is where it gets kind of weird. South Carolina and Virginia, um, I believe Virginia, just before he gets this patent, had just been granted a, a commission for a Grand Master of Virginia. And after this, there was a patent that went to South Carolina for a Grand Master of South Carolina. Also, in the line where they show receipt, where they show that they have paid out for insurance of that patent coming to Joseph Monfort, it says Joseph Monfort Esquire on being appointed provincial Grand Master for North Carolina. 10, 10, 10 pounds, 10 shillings. So it's interesting. Was Montfort the Grand Master of America or was he not? It's a good question and something we'll always debate. I do want to point out, though, um, that actually that debate is rather academic because at no point did Joseph Montfort, except for one lodge in Virginia, ever do any type of national chartering as we would see it today. He only worked within the constraints of North Carolina's borders, except for one time where he actually chartered somebody in Virginia. Now, <clears throat> Arnett, when James Milner dies from a horse riding accident, he split his head open and died immediately as he fell off a horse. Harnett, Cornelius Harnett becomes the district grand master. Now, at this point, we begin to get certain things charted, certain lodges charted. These are the Montfort lodges that start to get charted. And I actually posted two of them here along with Cornelius Harnett's signature. These are the only places where we find anything signed by Cornelius Harnett. We have no portraits of him. This is as close to his hand as we're going to get. But there are charters all over North Carolina that are Montford charters that are also signed by Cornelius Harnett. Now, Cornelius Harnett, he actually is going to get involved inside the revolution. Now, um, one of his lodge brothers is General Robert Howe. Robert Howe, by the way, is... Um, He's, he's this, this guy that has a brilliant military mind, and he's absolutely amazing in, in strategy. Um, he's also a firebrand, as is Cornelius Harnett at many times. Now, after the Battle of Alamance, where actually Cornelius Harnett fought alongside William Tryon against the regulators, um, England decided that they needed to get rid of William Tryon. He didn't know how to get along with North Carolinians. So he moves these guys, he moves uh, William Tryon out of North Carolina and sends down Josiah Martin. Now, Josiah Martin as a governor is perhaps the worst governor you could ever imagine, honestly. He uh, did great in New York where everybody's a loyalist and everybody was just fine with following the rule of, of British law. Uh, New York would be that way all through the, the revolution. North Carolina, again, follows its own train, right? Um, it, it, it does its own thing. But when Josiah Martin comes in, um, Cornelius Harnett begins to think of this as just bad policy of having Josiah Martin trying to quell the state and the uprising of our state. So he actually gets together with General Robert Howe, two St. John's brothers. They build up a militia in Wilmington and they march down to what's, where Southport is today and they burn Fort Johnston. Anybody who's been to Southport, you know that there are some rocks that are out by the water in front of the visitor center. And then there's that huge field and then there's the water and there's those rocks. Those rocks are actually the front skirt of the old Fort Johnston. They burnt it down. Now, Josiah Martin, being very upset about this, he tries to come down from New Bern and he comes up to Cape Fear only to find that Cornelius Harnett has now coordinated to basically 
block off any escape for Josiah Martin, and Josiah Martin cannot get off his boat. Josiah Martin is now stuck on board his ship called the Cruiser, and the de facto governor for North Carolina at this point is now Cornelius Harnett. And he's running committees of safety all over the state. He's moving material and gunpowder and guns and getting ready for a showdown. And his idea is definitely to keep Josiah Martin stuck on his, on his ship. Now, uh, this guy, Josiah Martin, who we see here, actually, this is uh, one of very few portraits. It's a small cameo, but it's one of very few portraits we have of him. Josiah Martin quickly writes to, to England and says, well, I first, I would like to become a lieutenant, if I may. England says, no, we don't trust you. And he says, okay, but here's my plan. Um, after the battles of Bunker Hill, Reed's Hill, if you will, after the Battle of Bunker Hill, there was a Scot that had fought up there. His name is Donald MacDonald. And we have many regulators who are still upset with the, with the people of Wilmington after crushing them at the Battle of Alamance, along with William Tryon, I'm not Tryon. I bet I can raise up those Scots, those Highland Scots, and they would get maybe 1,000, maybe even 10,000. If we have 10,000 of them, I want to have Cornwallis from Ireland, and I want Sir Peter Parker, the Admiral, yes, Spider-Man for my Marvel fans, Peter Parker to come down and we should all collect together at Brunswick Town, and then we can subdue the entire colony. Well, this actually isn't how this works out. Um, all the Scots, they congregate at Cross Creek, today's Fayetteville. Actually, one of the people that put it all together is a woman named Flora MacDonald. She was basically the Joan of Arc. She is the heroine, if you will, of, of Scotland. Um, and those Scots from Fayetteville, to make a long process short they march from Fayetteville come down an old slave road or auxiliary road which today would be 421 uh, came down and they were on their way to Brunswick and when they got to Curry North Carolina they ran into Alexander Lillington Richard Caswell and 1,000 angry patriots who had five cannons and many muskets pointed straight at them as they tried to cross that bridge at about three o'clock in the morning. That bridge, by the way, had also had all the planks pulled up, so it slowed down the Scots even more. Now, at this battle, it takes about three minutes, according to official counts. I would probably say it could have taken up to 20. 70 Scots, we think, were killed. Many others are going to be captured. A lot of money, a lot of weapons get captured. It is a singular patriot victory. And when Cornelius Harnett hears about this victory, much like Abraham Lincoln after the Battle of Antietam, uh, he realizes he has some major political momentum going. Now, I need to point out that in January, there had been a pamphlet that had been released. It was called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Um, I'm sure that you guys have heard of this pamphlet. The idea is that uh, that Americans um, are no longer Britons because they have been separated for so long, uh, that independence is the only right way to go. This was very much entertainment at the time. This was a firebrand material, but it was also a best-selling pamphlet because everybody loved to read it. Um, but in July, or I'm sorry, in January and February, nobody was really taking it seriously, except for maybe Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, um, Paul Revere, Cornelius Harnett, which by the way, Cornelius Harnett, after this moment, he's going to be called the Sam Adams of the South. Now, Cornelius Harnett, realizing that he has the political momentum, he quickly pens this idea of how all these these problems that they've had with the crown and he uses a certain lilt in his words and then he takes it to Halifax and at a committee there they they go through they read it they unanimously say that we like this pamphlet and this Halifax resolves that basically says because of divers problems 
that we have had with Britain, with the crown, because of taxation, because they are causing our slaves to rise up against us, because they are attacking our safety. Um, we therefore declare independence in North Carolina, and we invite all other colonies to do the same. Now, I know I'm not talking about the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, and something must have been happening in Mecklenburg County in 1775. But that has been lost, and who knows if it was the resolves that were 10 days later, or if it's the, if there really was a Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, but we do know that the Halifax Resolves is the first document that says that North Carolina is now independent from the crown and invites all the others to come join us. Now, this document actually gets sent up to Philadelphia, where when Congress, Continental Congress, reads it, they think it's a very interesting perspective, and they send it to their junior member, about a 23-year-old redheaded, tall, lanky, newly minted lawyer named Thomas Jefferson, the low guy on the totem pole, and they hand him the Halifax Resolves, and they said, here you go, blueprint, come up with something. Now, what he comes back with is the Declaration of Independence. That Declaration of Independence, by the way, if you, now I don't want to get into contextual um, comparisons here, deeply at least, but if you were to put them side by side, you will see how the Halifax results and the Declaration of Independence, these two are very related. That Halifax Resolves, it is the blueprint. Without it, we would have never had the Declaration of Independence. If April 12, 1776 had not happened in North Carolina, we would not be celebrating on July 4th, Independence Day. In fact, who knows exactly when we might call ourselves independent? We might not have the oldest functioning government in the world, which we do have today if it had not been for Cornelius Harnett. Now, this is actually why I call him the founder of America. He came up with the Halifax Resolves. In Halifax, they pass it, it gets sent up, and from that blueprint, we end up with the Declaration of Independence. It's definitely something to think about, and it's definitely something for North Carolina Masons to be proud of. Look at the hand our fraternity played in creating this great experiment. Now, unfortunately, during the war, um, not much actually happens because after Cornelius Harnett had coordinated, along with Mad Jimmy Moore, another Freemason, I might add, as well as a few others, um, the Battle of, of Moore's Creek, England never got a very strong grip in the South until 1781. In fact, they never got North Carolina until 1781, when after a horrific battle for, Cornel or for uh, Cornwallis, he decided he needed to take a break. Now, anybody who lives here in North Carolina, you know where you go when you need a break. You go to Wilmington. We've got beaches. Cornwallis was not very different. Cornwallis uh, actually sent Major Craig into Wilmington. Major Craig comes into Wilmington and he subdues the city, which wasn't actually very hard for him to do, to get it ready for Cornwallis to come in and stay at the Bergen Wright, Wright House. But in doing so, they also captured Cornelius Harnett. Now, Cornelius, Cornelius Harnett was 58 years old and they beat him bloody, then threw him over the back of a horse like a sack of potatoes and they walked him through every street of Wilmington so that Wilmington could see what their proud son had become. After this, they throw him into a prison, a makeshift prison. It's an open air prison at that in Wilmington. Now, after the beating, after being thrown into an open air prison at the mercy of the elements, when the British realized, or I should say when Cornwallis's troops realized that Cornelius Harnett was close to death, 
they decided, oh, he's no longer a problem, and they let him go. Now, another thing that actually happened at this time, it seems that Cornwallis, being a Freemason himself, did not see us in North Carolina as worthy brother Masons. And every lodge he came across, because he understood that we could use our lodges um, as lines of communication, and we did, he would take their records and destroy them or hide them. We're not sure what's happened to them, which is why so many records like St. John's Lodge, number one, doesn't have records until 1788, even though they were chartered in 1755. All those records up to 1781 were lost. And we think it's because of Cornwallis moving through. But Cornelius Harnett was sent home. And when he died, um, it's rather interesting. They have it uh, as April 20th, but the death certificate says April 28th. It seems that Cornelius Harnett was still very wealthy. But his tombstone, if you notice that there's little something here written on the bottom. Now, brethren and friends, I'm sure you knew that I couldn't go through an entire lecture on history without beginning to delve or at least touch on the esoteric. Cornelius Harnett, on his tombstone, he had chosen a poem by Alexander Pope. And what's interesting is on that tombstone, if you look at it, it looks inconspicuous. It says, slave to no sect who takes no private road, but looks through nature up to nature's God. Very deist, right? That idea that God is the prime mover, the prime architect, but after creation doesn't take too much many cares into the endeavors of mankind. Well, if you just took that one line, you would think of Cornelius Harnett as a deist. But what follows immediately after that line in this poem is slave to no sect who takes no private road, but looks through nature up to nature's God, pursues that chain which links the immense design, joins heaven and earth and moral and divine. See that no being any bliss can know, but touches some above and some below. All right, everyone, I thank you very much. That was my presentation on Cornelius Harnett. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Well, ben, that was awesome. And just like I promised everyone at the beginning, I knew it would be entertaining, and it absolutely was. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ben, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, and fire away. Nothing? Really? <laughs> I thought that last one might actually get a get a question. But... Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, Cornelius Harnett, I mean, I had heard of the Halifax Resolves, but I didn't know that much about them. Didn't really realize that they were more or less the blueprint for the Declaration of Independence. Right. And most people don't realize that if you want to go to the birthplace of America, many people go to Boston uh, or Philadelphia or even New York. Right. And New York was was definitely the financial center. Um, that's why. Um, oh, no, his name just left my head and it shouldn't have. Hate it when that happens. Alexander Hamilton, um, when negotiating over the the place for our our capital city, uh, decided to put it very close to, um, to Virginia, as long as the bank stayed in New York. Alexander Hamilton, by the way, he was Secretary of the Treasury. He lived in New York. He wanted the banks to stay there so that they wouldn't be in the hands of uh, Democratic Republicans in the South. So as long as the banks stayed North, the South could have the capital city. And they decided to put it right between Virginia and Maryland, so that wouldn't be uh, held by any state. Um, it's, and it's all very interesting points. But even with all of that, 
the actual birthplace of America is in North Carolina, and actually, I would argue in Curry, North Carolina, and you can go to it at Moores Creek National Battlefield, which, by the way, is free to walk on. You can walk around it. There is this point between a bridge and the cannons and the land wall works, which are still kind of there, and it looks like a giant green triangle which of course to us Masons would mean something. Um, but that is actually where so many Scots fell and so many Patriots fired on those Scots. If that battle hadn't gone the way it did, we wouldn't have America as we have it today. And that's why I would say that's our birthplace, along with the actual blueprints for our ideals being in the Halifax results from this guy from Wilmington. Brother Ben, have you been yes. to Halifax Lodge? To which one? Halifax. Halifax. I have not made it to Halifax Lodge yet. Well, that's where Joseph Mumford is buried, in the lodge, right in front of the lodge building. That's a, uh, oh, what is that? White Hart, right? That's right. Yeah, so but one of the but, lodges I belong to in Windsor, chair to number five, is one of Mumford's lodges. Amazing. It also has the distinction of being the first York Wright body in North Carolina. Utterly amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's so still use, it's still oper it's still an unbroken record? <laughs> oh yes. That's brilliant. So uh you were chartered when was that seventeen seventeen seventy two? We were actually chartered in seventeen seventy six, I believe it was and went through some hard times. We lost the charter in, 80, in 1803, regained it in 1804. At one time, it was charity number 40, I think it was. And then in 1898 uh, or some such time close to it, all lodges in North Carolina had their original numbers. And that's wow. when charity became number five. That is uh, utterly amazing. Now, your charter, is it the original still on your wall, or did you guys uh, send it to be to be? No, it's, it's, uh, the charter is still there as it was. Oh, uh, wow. I actually am doing some work on that lodge building now. Uh, I'm not since we've been sort of shut out of things, but um, in doing that, I found a Bible, an altar Bible, that was – printed in 1832 uh i have found we, we have an old old um safe that i don't know when that thing was made it's forever old but we have minutes in that large building from back in the 1800s and so forth and, my uh, goodness and actually the uh, museum of the album hall in elizabeth city has a masonic um uh, display and we'll have for a while to come from the area lodges there mm -hmm. and one of their curators is going to come help us hopefully get our stuff squared away so we can put, uh, put it in the lodge or put it somewhere so people can see it so it'll be looked at oh wow i would love to see that myself actually well, well i'll tell you what i'll give you a personal invitation we oh. need the uh, fourth Thursday night of the month, whenever we go back to meeting, you know, now we're sort of locked out. Right, right. Yeah, I've always, I, I would love to see that. I also need to swing up to um, Whiteheart because I, I hear that there's a gate there that swings open only for a traveling pilgrim. It is. And they also have gotten that lodge building uh, at Halifax became unstable in the second floor where the lodge room was. Right. And for a long time, they had to walk around the outside edge of it. Well, uh, they, uh, they have since repaired that, I understand. And they are now doing it. See, the other thing is, William R. Davy was just down the road from where Halifax is. Right. And, and William R. Davy, of course, we know is, is uh, the be-all, do-all in Masonry for a while in North Carolina. Right, And the right. Halifax Resolve happened at the Halifax Lodge. Right. They did. 
They did. And oh, I yeah. wonder how that happened with Cornelius Harnett being such a fervent Mason. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and William Mar William Davy, um, he's an interesting character as well. Uh, he actually, <laughs> while John Adams was messing things up as president, um, <laughs> and we had some real problems with the X Y Z affair and oh, yeah. a pseudo war, what we call the quasi war with France, where we were actually at war with France, but nobody had the guts to declare it. <laughs> um, <laughs> William <laughs> William Davy actually jumped on board a ship and went over to. France. He is the reason it ended. While our president at the time just had no diplomatic wherewithal whatsoever, it landed on that North Carolinian to basically stop what was going to turn into one of the worst wars the world had seen up to that point. Oh, yeah. And John Adams had one other distinction, too. <laughs> he was the first anti-Masonic person involved in our revolution. That's and very true. His son took it even further. That's right. Yeah. The anti-Masonic party. Not very well, to tell you the truth. No, well, what's really funny is uh, at one point for the anti-Masonic party, it did get seven electoral votes. It's the most electoral votes that a third party has ever gotten. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, which is <laughs> kind of bad news, if you think. Um, <laughs> but while there was a debate going on of course you know this was against andrew jackson right who was a freemason and at one point andrew jackson looked at over and one of the anti-masonic uh representatives he's like i just sat in lodge with him <laughs> so the anti-masonic party had masons in it <laughs> just kind of made okay. it fall apart so <laughs> well Ill-laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> Oft go a leg. <laughs> Often go awry, yeah. All right. Does anyone else have uh, questions, comments, threats for Ben? Possibly. Hey, Brother Ben. Yes. Brother Ben, this is uh, Stan Bevers, uh, Blue Ridge 435 and Marble Springs 439. How you doing? How you doing, my brother? I am doing well. Now, I noticed the uh, poem that you read there at the end. It, uh, I don't remember it exactly. I've not read that before, but it was uh, basically as, uh, as above, so below. Yes. Does, did Harnett have any, to your knowledge, uh, appendant body connections, or what was his uh, esoteric leanings in masonry? That is a really hard question to answer because I can't find writings on it. Um, the last person to... There's a lot of problems um, for Cornelius Harnett. Um, there's not a whole lot left, like no portraits, very few writings. What we do have from him is mostly statescraft. Um, we do know that he was an active Mason because things are being chartered left and right. Right? Um, you know, with, with Cornelius Harnett's uh, signature on it. But <sighs> appendant bodies... I don't think he was a member of one because we didn't have an appendant body until I want to say it was 1803 when Concord chapter came to Wilmington. I may be wrong on my date there, but I want to say it was 1803. That's the earliest uh, minutes I saw. And for a long time, it was St. John's Knowledge number one and Concord. That's how they signed everything. So if you were a Johnny, you were a Concord. Um, carrying on in that tradition, just by chance, I am also a member of Concord, uh, <laughs> right? I, as a historian, I was like, I can't pass that up. Um, but I don't know just how er esoteric he was, but his, the clue that he left on his gravestone really leads me to think that he's definitely one of us. While that's a deist line, and everybody was a deist at that time. That was kind of the thing to be, um, especially among Freemasons at that point. Um, his as above, so below, I'm sure he knew exactly what he was choosing, even as he was dying, to have on his gravestone. Matt's lighting up. Yeah, yeah, he caught me on camera uh, lighting up my cigar. <laughs> But uh, so, <laughs> does anyone else have any questions for Ben? Brother Ben, uh, this is Tim Dalton of Ashburn Starling Lodge, number 288 in Ashburn, Virginia. Hello, I love Van Gogh. Thank you. Um, what lodge was it that uh, the, the good brother chartered while he had his, his period as uh, 
Grand Master of Masons of the Americas. <laughs> oh, Momfort? Oh, man. Um, let's see. That would have been anything after 1771 all the way up to 1775 when he died. Uh, you said that he chartered a lodge in Virginia, and so I yeah, I don't know exactly which lodge. I actually found that Philip Roth, an old writer, had mentioned uh, that that he had actually chartered there, um, but it's only one lodge. So it seems that uh, that he really wasn't acting like a Grand Master of America, <laughs> as well. But I'm not sure which lodge that is. I'm going to have to look deeper um, now that you've asked the question. I had another question, kind of unrelated. Um, I have a house in North Carolina in Grace Creek, and um, I'm retired Army. And oh, for nice! For one of my leadership schools, I I did the Battle of Moore's Creek as as one of my leadership paper study, mm -hmm. like a three month project. I, I'd be interested in speaking with you offline more about that, about some of the other Masonic connections that I that I, I found while I was doing because I, I researched it from a two different perspectives. I, I worked in um well I was a counterintelligence in NCO. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote it from the perspective of you know military analysis but also from the through the lens of some uh counterintelligence operations and also uh being a Freemason. So right. I, looking at some different things that I'd be interested in collaborating or, you know, discussing with you later. That would be awesome. Yeah. I used to work at the battlefield as a researcher um, okay. when I was doing my thesis actually in the Byzantine history as well as, um, so I do um, philosophy and a few other things. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of eclectic that way, but I was working there to, to um, you know, make ends meet while writing my thesis. Um, and I was hoping to get the government job at the end, but unfortunately there was a sequester. Um, and there's an official story. And then there's the real story. That official story, of course, was written at about like 1880, uh, 1899, whenever they created the first friends group at at Moore's Creek and then it just kind of you know filtered into this like national myth if you will kind of story that they have that there was Mother Covington and Mother Covington's daughter two cannons that's all they had and the guy that got shot he was you know he's he his wife rode like 60 miles to come save him none of which happened there are five cannon at least uh, nobody came riding in 60 miles the battle did not last for hours it was three minutes tops you know <laughs> so yeah, so um, I would love to talk about that offline as well, because there's a lot of Masonic connections in there that I could do. A, I have done a whole other presentation and given Masonic tours around the battlefield. Um, oh, I do see that Glenn Chamberlain actually asked if he had ever traveled north. And um, is it okay if I address that one too? Go for it. Right. So one thing I did leave out of my little lecture just um, for time, um, uh, like I said, we have a lot of um, writings from Cornelius Harnett that are all statescraft. He was a member of the Continental Congress. He did travel north to Philadelphia to represent North Carolina in uh, 1777. So he was part of the, he was actually one of our true founders, not just a local hero, but he also went national for us as well. He was in the Continental Congress. All right. So any other brothers with uh, questions for Ben? I mean, even go esoteric if you guys want. <laughs> hey, go for it. We've got time. <laughs> okay, whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> so, yeah, so going back to the... It is just epitaph, water, by the way. So. <laughs> going back to the epitaph on um, on Hornet's uh, gravestone, you want to maybe dive into maybe that little esoteric thing and what he, he probably intended by having that on there? Sure. Here, I'm going to share my screen out again. Um, hopefully. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So here we go. And ah, here we are. So, it, you know, it's rather interesting that slave to no sect who, who takes no private road, 
but looks through nature up to nature's God. There's a lot of ways of taking this, right? I mean, one is you're looking at things as a deist. Um, you follow nature, you follow order, you follow science, research, you know, the, the, the empirical knowledge that you gain, right? You could look at it that way. But then there's the whole idea of slave to no sect. And that is definitely the open mind um, of people no longer in the torrent. Some people might recognize that phrase. Um, it, it's slave to no sect who takes no private road, right? It, it, it really, it lends itself to this idea of looking through nature, through what we can learn. And remember at this time that part of science was alchemy. I know, so I, we'll always hear that there's no alchemy in Freemasonry. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, I've got degrees number four through 33 that probably disagree with that. But okay, so <laughs> heck, you can find it in degree number three as well in your grips. Um, but there's, um, it, it does seem that he's looking at nature through nature's God, the idea of, of science in some ways pursues that chain which links the immense design that's that's an amazing line pursues the chain which you could almost see the oroboros right that linking that that connection the immense design that design of that that great creator um you know like clockwork arguments i don't know if you guys have heard the watchmaker argument the idea of that there is a god uh because if you look at a watch you cannot but be amazed by the genius it takes to make that watch and just imagine the genius that it took to make the maker of the watch right so you know it, it, this is linking us in over here even though that argument comes later but it still goes back to um oh who was that was that saint thomas was that aquinas i believe aquinas i could be wrong um joins heaven and earth and moral and divine as above so below seeing that no being any bliss can know that brings us almost to an idea of gnosticism after all gnosis in greek is knowledge to know right um so not seeing that no being any bliss can know it's you have to learn it really for yourself and you have to to understand that bliss you have to leave the being behind um but touch of some above and some below that is purely the idea of as above so below that spiritual to the mundane that um spirit to body that heaven to hell right all of this is uh, to me Whenever I, I noticed um, that Alex, because I actually, I do travel to uh, Harnett's grave, actually, often. Um, I know this sounds like really weird, but I do go there to meditate, right? Um, so that grave is at St. Um, oh, my goodness, the St. James Church, St. James Episcopal Church, downtown Wilmington, corner of Market and Third. And... Um, his grave is right there for anyone to walk up to. But I do go sometimes right there to think things over. And of course, I had noticed that there was this epitaph on there. And I recognized it as Alexander Pope. So I knew that was Epistle of Man number four. Um, so I grabbed it and I quickly read Epistle of Man number four and remembered what came after that line. I really do believe that he was hinting at his uh, esoteric nature right there. And unfortunately, it's it, deeper writings from him have been lost. But you're right. The, the line that caught me was, uh, but touches some above and some below. And I thought, man, that just really sticks out to me. As right. Really esoteric that, and that pursues the chain with the links of the uh, links, the immense design, right? The, and Matt, you know about design, right? And you know, there's a lot that that could be said even deeper in in there that I don't want to really go, um, you know, 
um, we're, we're in places where it's raining. <laughs> no, 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 right. But I mean, it's like he references the Fibonacci sequence. Yes, he does. Uh, that Fibon the, uh, Fibonacci um, number here, it is almost built into it. And um, that idea of that chain, that, that link, right? That circle, that Ouroboros. It, 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 as soon as I saw this, I, I was like, oh, wait a minute. He's trying to tell us something. And yeah, I had to go back to Alexander Pope to take a look. Now, what's interesting is um, R.D.W. Connor, the last person who wrote a book about Cornelius Harnett, he wrote in, I want to say it was 1909. Yeah, I think it was published 1907 or 1909. And that's the actual last book on Cornelius Harnett that's been published of any caliber. So um, I think it's a little bit overdue that we revisit this man and delve deeper and try to find more papers and more of his writing and not just what's in the colonial records because there's something hidden. That was fascinating. I think, um, you know, with uh, Cornelius Harnett, we have Harnett County, North Carolina, named after him, which is right down the road from me, about uh, 20 minutes away. And, um, you know, I, so I knew who he was as a North Carolinian, but I did not realize the uh, magnitude of his impact as far as the Halifax resolves and his, his role in our democracy. Right. Yeah, it, it, he's often forgotten. I, I almost always find it a little upsetting that um, to learn about Cornelius Harnett, maybe not even in North Carolina, you might not even hear of him. He's just not old enough. It used to be taught in his history when I was in school. So he was in there. A <clears throat> long, long time ago in a country far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still in my history classes. My oh, students, yeah. my students are, are always say, how come we had to come to college to find this one out? And how come he has only that one obelisk on Market Street? Why is that the only thing he's got? And if you uh -oh. look around, it's like Monticello and the Jefferson Memorial and all this stuff. The dude was a 23-year-old redhead who had way too much money for, to know what to do with it, you know? And d d d why does he get all of the credit? He ran off to France. Cornelius Harnett was here fighting. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'd like to point out, too, that poem that you just read, uh, The Epic of Man, mm -hmm. also explains something else. The second pump. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I, I wasn't sure if I... I Further than that, put us some profane ears here and there. Right. Well, I wasn't sure if we could go into the circumpunct with, um, with it raining. I'll say. What's that? You, did you say you couldn't go into it when it's raining? Oh, you haven't heard that? No, I haven't heard that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Glenn, do you want to explain it to him? <laughs> so, I'll um, do it later, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like whenever the right cop pulls you over. I've got a little yeah, red got, dog. Got I've got a little dog with a red collar. Right? <laughs> There's another way of putting it, too, in the South. We say you got too many possums up the same tree. Yeah. That might be it, too. Yeah. <laughs> See, and y'all thought this would not get esoteric. Look at this. It's amazing. Ben, well, of course I touch on it. Awesome. And next time I'm down in Wilmington, we're going to the Cork and Fork, grab some burgers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love it. And I will actually, um, if anybody ever wants to do a, like a Masonic tour, it's something I've always wanted to put together. Once, once we're past this COVID thing, um, it, it's, you know, it, depending on how many people we get together and if, as long as, you know, as long as everybody's healthy and I guess it's under 10 people, isn't that the way this works? Um, I mean, there could be ways of doing it safely. Um, I would, I'd have to reach out to a couple of friends over at Brunswick Town. We might be able to get, like, you know, I could do, like, the Masonic part. They could take you through, like, other parts of the history. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that they're finding in the digs. One last thing I want to show you guys, because this was just kind of neat, even though I had it there, and I'm going back and sharing my screen. 
Um, and I was trying to save time, but since we're just chatting at this point, I'll show it to you. Here, let me make it large. All right. So that little stone that is sitting there that says Wilkes and Liberty 45, that is actually um, like, okay, when Freemasons uh, in Germany were being slaughtered, um, possibly between 80,000 to 800,000, depending on who you ask, right? Uh, or 80,000 to 100,000, excuse me, depending on who, which historian you ask. It's a lot that were being slaughtered in Nazi Germany. We had a certain symbol that we wore. And if you wear it today, you also remember uh, Loge Liberté Chérie, right? The, uh, the, the lodge that was in the concentration camp. And that is, of course, a little blue flower called a forget-me-not. Mm -hmm. Right, and in many ways, it was also a symbol of the, the resistance, la resistance, right? Kind of like the um, the black flowers in France, or um, certain buttons that we might see today, right? You n immediately know that ah, this person is part of the resistance of some form or another, depending where you are. Uh, the Solidarność buttons that were around Poland. Well, this button that you see here, this is actually um, a stone out of a cufflink. And it says Wilkes and Liberty number 45. Now, the guy who wrote it was named Wilkes. And this is actually a cufflink that people would wear in resistance to the crown. Just as like, you know, like, like we wear our, um, as Prince Halls call it, we wear our light today. Right, so that we know like-minded people. Well, this was one of those, but it was a political thing. And the guy Wilkes, he wrote this very inflammatory pamphlet, number 45. And I think you guys would really enjoy reading his work. It is inflammatory. It is, um, it's cutting political commentary for the time. And people that thought that the crown needed to go, they would wear these. And that was actually found at Brunswick Town in a place where I had kept telling them there was an inn here, that inn stayed active until 1820. It's gone, but it, it used to be here. Well, until they've actually unearthed the foundations and found this. And this is from about 1765, 1766, and people were wearing this in protest of the Stamp Act. So this is one of those really cool finds that came actually right out of Brunswick Town, right outside of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So I thought you guys might enjoy getting the background on that. By the way, Wilkes, uh, one time he was speaking to the Earl of Sandwich, the one that you know fought against America and created a sandwich because he didn't want his hands to get dirty while playing poker. You know that story? Yeah, he wanted to have like ham and, and salad and I told his uh, manservant to put it between two slices of bread and it was the sandwich. Yeah. So that same guy um, said uh, to the to, to Wilkes, um, look, either you're going to die by the gallows or by the pox. And without missing a beat, Wilkes said, yes, I guess that depends if I embrace your policies or your mistress. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of how Wilkes was. So Ben, you were talking about the, you know, of course, the forget me not, the um the concentration camp in Nazi uh occupied Europe. And mm -hmm. the that's the Esterwegen or I may be mispronouncing that, but Esterwegen uh concentration camp. And there's this great monument or memorial there to uh, the Masons that really formed a Masonic lodge right under the Nazis noses and uh, the Nazis never caught on. Right. They never did. And um, actually, hold on, I'm going to get that. Um, uh, here it is. Okay. So here I'll um, share my screen and I'll get that up for everyone to see. So yeah, I kind of do this often. Can you tell? Uh, <laughs> so there it is. Yes. Yeah, at the Essewegen concentration camp. That is to Liberté Chérie, or Liberty and, and Kindness. Yeah, and um, yeah, there it is. That, that is to all the, 
all the Freemasons that were lost to the, to the Nazis. It's, um, you know, we always hear, of course, what happened to the Jews, right, was absolutely horrendous. It is truly a Holocaust for them. Um, but we often forget that um, anarchists, socialists, um, Freemasons, uh, homosexuals, the handicapped, uh, Roma, they also, each one of these were also killed by these fascists. And um, it's good to remember that line of our heritage every time you look down at your square and compasses to remember what we've also endured as Freemasons. That is a uh, powerful monument right there. I've, I've you know, seen that image several times and just the Ashler breaking through the Iron Gate is, um, I mean, it really shows the, the perseverance of masonry and, uh, you know, that it does break through that. And if I'm not mistaken, that is an actual piece of the uh, fencing that went around the concentration camp. They I believe it is. I believe it is. I always loved the tiled pavement as well that they have. And what always uh, has spoken to me as well is that the Ashler is rough. Yeah, yeah it, it's not just that it's an Ashler, but it's a rough Ashler actually, breaking I through would, those pines of fascism. I, I would argue that point, Ben, because I would say to you, that's a perfect natural. Because if you tool it with the tools of a fellow craft, that's the way it will come out. They had no way of polishing. They had no way of, they had no way of cutting it dead square as we find today. That would be what we would call a perfect natural. Notice the square mm -hmm. corners. The sides of it are the same and the top is the same. That's a good point. That, uh, um, yeah, I know that we would like to think that they didn't have a way of polishing, but we do know with the pyramids that um, people were able to polish quite well. In fact, the pyramids were originally covered in limestone, and it was yep. so polished it was almost as a mirror. Right. Uh, it, limestone so is they, very easy because it's soft. Granite right. can be done right way because it's hard. Which is, you know, which also brings us to the idea of why are we free masons? Are we working in free stone, the soft stone, to form it into things like gargoyles, perfect northeast corner stones, or are we able to travel? And Glenn, you're you're muted. If you will oh. look at the, uh, the the tools and implements of masonry in operative masonry back when we were talking about so far as gargoyles and so forth and so on. If you took the stone that was used, you would see it would be a different stone from what it was to be something that braced or built the wall. Uh, that was one of the secrets of masonry in operative masonry was they had a mason who knew by trial and error originally that that's the way this stone could be used for this. This stone could be used for that and so forth. Right. And, uh, and that's why in, in, in the Masonic families, there were all kinds of construction workers. We think they were all stonemasons, but they were not. They were, they were glazers that actually built window frames. They were carpenters, furniture makers. There were tilers who set, who built and made shingles, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. So it was the entire construction crew that was in the Masonic family. That's absolutely <laughs> right, which is why we had modes of recognition. So you knew exactly where each person right. fell. Right, exactly. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and so it, it, it's a lot easier to have that mode of recognition than reading through, if you don't know how to read, reading through somebody's possible resume, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and at that time, there, you know, not many people really knew how to read, but they understood the ideas, which they were hiding in 3, 5, and 7 of 3, 4, and 5, what that could actually do. You have that, you end up with the right corner, and that's magic. It's... But I know I'm walking into no, some that, esoterics here. That's well, we've been going for almost an hour and a half, but <laughs> that was a uh, fantastic, great presentation. Um, before we sign off, uh, just one more round. Does anyone have any questions or comments? 
I do like what Tom, Tim said, the Philosopher's Stone, the stone bursting through the bounds of tyranny and slavery, freedom yeah. that extends beyond all bounds. That's... I was just about to bring that up, and you know, that that's, uh, that's a very Masonic thing, the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, compare that to, you know, what we refer to as the perfect Ashler now. Um, you know, don't get P.D. Newman started on the Philosopher's Stone because that'll turn into something completely different. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and I, I do think the Philosopher's Stone is a perfect allegory for what we call the Ashler today. Same thing, same concept. And it's that uh, taking something in its, in its crude form and making it perfect right right and you know as we're going through this it just reminds me was it last week we had the discussion on logic um and especially uh, aristotelian logic yeah. right and yeah and it's i i just you know for everybody who's constantly watching um th this this series that you've put on matt for everybody who's constantly watching this it's amazing to think like as we moved into the esoteric on, on Cornelius Arnett's uh, gravestone, none of that works without the understanding of Nicomachean ethics, um, which is the virtue ethics of Aristotle, um, or the logic, Aristotelian logic, especially the idea of uh, of, of syllogisms and that coming from. Um, deductive reasoning and then inductive reasoning, which does not use an actual syllogism. It's a totally different animal. Uh, the modus ponens, the modus tollens, understanding the forms, um, understanding how all of this actually fits, the ideas of being able, what's in the name, being able to identify things by what they are and what they are not, and to classify that come, that is the basis of ideas of Freemasonry, as well as of alchemy. All of this, it all goes back to Aristotle in so many ways and not the Romans. And therefore it is to the Greeks and not the Romans. Okay, but right, everybody remembers that part of uh, the second lecture. Yeah. But I just wanted to, to you know, point out, it seems I've always been amazed um, by this series, um, Matt, that you have put on, by the, the continuum by, that is created from topic to topic and from speaker to speaker. And I commend you for a job well done. Thank you. I, I'm amazed guy. myself. I'm surprised they haven't kicked me out of refracted light yet. <laughs> I doubt they will. This is perfect. I think, I think you just got yourself a full-time job that you probably don't get paid for. That's right. That's right. If I can make a, make a living being a Freemason, I would. Um, <laughs> and brother, brother Lynn Chow, and I'm so glad Lynn's on tonight, uh, but on Facebook, she said, thank you for being a part of the panel on Saturday. And for anyone that hasn't seen that, uh, Brother Ben was one of our panelists for the Being, Being the Light um, panel discussion. And that video is uh, live on uh, Refracted Light Facebook page and the Refracted Light YouTube channel. And it's been shared some other places too. So if you have not yet seen that, I would, I would certainly encourage that. It's about a, a two hour presentation, but uh, very, very powerful. Uh, bringing together 10 panelists from around the country uh, to talk about some of the cultural issues we're having today in our society with uh, discrimination, divisiveness, just the hate, the level of that going on. And to see all these brothers from, um, you know, Prince Hall and everyone coming together, different backgrounds and cultural uh, histories, and being able to share their perspectives, that was a very emotional and a very powerful, powerful night. So uh, again, if you haven't seen that, please check it out. It's, it's there on the Refracted Light Facebook group. Uh, and Ben was absolutely a asset to that, to that panel. I think you're two letters off. Yeah, I almost said you're an ass, but no. <laughs> No, it was an absolute honor to be there, and um, it was amazing. The panel had people uh, that were in ways that they were, di it's diverse in ways that you wouldn't notice at first glance. Um, and that that panel 
that I think that's what made it so much more powerful is there was so much more diversity. Some people that are immigrants that you would have never guessed had immigrated twice. So, you know, they couldn't see it on them. You can't hear it in them. Right. And others um, who uh, may, you might have thought was, oh, that's got to be a Baptist. No. Right. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, uh, or, you know, you, you look and have an assumption. But the actual diversity of that panel was incredible. And what you see in that discussion, it, it doesn't just scratch the surface. It dives into, into the deep abyss of the actual problem. And I, I was, it was an honor, and I was humbled to be there. Glad you were there. Made a world of difference. Okay. Well, uh, brothers, friends, thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to do this again next week. I have, so far, we have speakers booked through uh, the end of June, and as long as uh, certain parts parts of our country are still experience, experiencing quarantine and lockdown, we're just going to continue to do this. And then once things return to normal and we start meeting in our lodges again on a regular basis, uh, we're still going to keep this refracted light. And uh, the North Carolina Science Research Society we're still going to keep these presentations going because it is really reaching a large audience. And, uh, you guys have absolutely been awesome. We see the same faces, uh, presentation after presentation week after week. And, um, you know, I've gotten to know many of you and, uh, it, it, it really is humbling. Um, one of these days you'll get sick of me and you'll just, you know, you'll petition Facebook, to get rid of me completely. I get it. But, but for right now, uh, you guys have been fantastic and I really appreciate that. And Ben, uh, again, as always, I appreciate you tonight and we're going to have to have you on again because these are, uh, fantastic discussions. Well, I'd, I'd be glad to accept. Um, if you guys have anything that you'd like to hear about too, I mean, I could take it on. So, yeah. Yeah. So anybody listening, if you have any suggestions for Ben, uh, shoot me a message on Facebook and I'll, I'll run it by him and see if that's something he's interested in, uh, in speaking about. I mean, when it comes to history, you're not going to find many people who can, can beat Ben and make it entertaining and fun where it doesn't put you to sleep. I mean, that's, that's incredible in itself. Oh, I tried. Well, you nailed it, brother. All right. All right, well, everyone, thank you for joining us, and we will do it again next week.